following us and I'm not acquainted with them. Ben Henderson is the Director of Operations and Cabinet Affairs for Government Police of Colorado. He began his career as a fiscal analyst for the Arizona legislature, worked in community and economic development for downtown Phoenix, and subsequently served as a deputy CEO for government Doug Busey, where he helped design and implement Arizona management system. Most recently, Ben served as a deputy director for budget in Colorado Office of State Planning and Budgeting before taking on his current role. Hello, Ben. It's very nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. Uh, Yasin Huang uh, is the marketing manager at Diode. She covers impacts of emerging technologies, especially blockchain, for a variety of media outlets. And in 2016, Yasin helped start the Taipei Ethereum Meetup community. In 2019, she founded the Radical Exchange Taipei chapter. Hello, Yasin. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thanks for having me. And finally, Kevin Owoki. Kevin Owoki is the founder of Gitcoin.co, a blockchain-based network for growing open source software with incentive, incentive incentivization mechanics. He has 10 years of engineering leadership experience in startups and open source software, and he is a community organizer in Boulder, Colorado tech scene. Kevin, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. It's thrilled to be here. So uh, before we start the conversation, just for our audience, as I would like to say, I just note that uh, for the Q&A that will follow the initial conversation, you can uh, go to slider.com and uh, put in the event code that is 29062 and ask any questions and vote the questions, vote for the questions you prefer as well. So to kick off the conversation, I would first like to ask each of our speakers to briefly sort of introduce us to the institutional innovations or social upgrades as, they are, as we refer to them uh, that, uh, that they sort of help uh, develop or implemented or uh, participated in. So I would like to begin with uh, Ben, if that's okay with you, Ben. Awesome, thanks Marco. Um... Yeah, so uh, Marco, as you said, I'm, I'm the director of operations for Governor Polis in Colorado. Um, most of my job is spent focusing on performance management, uh, process improvement, making sure that we're building systems that, that lead to good decision making. And um, about a year and a half ago, the state legislature, uh, the Democratic Caucus, uh, got together and used quadratic voting as a tool to prioritize their funding uh, in, in the state legislature to make sure that they were spending the, the kind of marginal dollar in the right place. Um, and what we learned is, is in the executive branch, um, there's lots of opportunities to use that same tool to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. That's really where I spend a lot of my time. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, I'm working with state employees, um, department leaders, department directors to, to build systems. And so um, in, in kind of in lieu of a PowerPoint presentation, I, I thought I would just kind of um, Give a give a brief example of kind of what's at stake uh, and and why we do the the why we use the tools we do. Um, so uh, I'm I'm a big music nerd, and although people get really into the visualization, I thought I'd do some data sonification. Um, so I want to talk about our unemployment insurance system for a second. So when someone loses their job, they come to the state uh, looking for benefits, looking to to make sure they can make ends meet um, and make their next payment. And if you look at um, all of 2019, and you kind of take all the people who called into our Department of Labor and Employment searching for uh, some relief, some financial relief. Um, I took that number and I sped it up by a hundred, just for the sake of time, so we're not sitting here forever. Um, and this is how fast um, it took, you know, every, every, every click as a person uh, calling into the insurance system, um, asking for help from the government. So at the, um, at the height of 2009, during the last recession, when we had uh, the housing collapse, the, we saw a serious increase um, in that. So this is how fast we were getting calls into the unemployment insurance system, more, more than twice the speed. Um, and so you can see uh, we had a serious increase. <clears throat> 
But just to put things in perspective, um, at the height of 2020, in the second week of April, um, we had exponential growth. It was like 2,000% increase. And this is how fast people were calling in to our unemployment system uh, in a way that was um, draining the system, draining our work workforce, draining our employees. Uh, and, and we knew we, we needed to react. We needed to, uh, to do something in the right way. And we're using quadratic voting as a tool to make these kinds of decisions, to put our values and our priorities in the right place, um, to make sure we're focusing and using evidence and data and science as much as possible to drive our decision making, to spend our time and our resources in the right place. Uh, and quadratic voting is one of the best tools to do that because it allows people to truly express themselves in a way that normal voting doesn't. You can show your preference to a certain degree. You can vote against things. Um, it allows for the minority groups. So things like smaller agencies or smaller communities who don't always get the kind of um, impact that they, that they like to, uh, this tool allows their voice to be heard. Uh, and, and we've seen it make drastic improvements. And so um, I, I implemented it in our kind of across state government. And then since then we've seen agents, the tool is so cool and exciting that they've adopted it themselves and asked, you know, how can I use quadratic voting? How, how can I do this in my own office? And so now we've seen uh, several agencies adopt the tool as well and begin to make management decisions at every level in the organization uh, using quadratic voting. And so I, th I think that's, that's the only thing I'd like to mention. Thanks, Marco. Thank you very much, Ben. I hope we will continue the discussion. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so uh, next I would like to ask Yasin if she would kindly introduce us to the Taiwan civic hacker scene. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello from Taiwan. <laughs> it's midnight <laughs> in Taipei. I'm in Taipei City. Um, I miss Denver, Colorado. Um, I was there um, in February for the East Denver event. Um, I went to this, the same Web3. Yeah, um, the really, really cool event. Yeah, I think Abby was the moderator or like a speaker. Um, yep. So I met all these kind of bunch of really, really cool people and I was really happy to be there, but it was freezing cold. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I really miss them. I hope to visit there again. Um, so a little introduction from, from my side. Um, so I'm part of the team at Diode. Um, and so a few words at Di about Diode. So it's an American blockchain startup company founded by uh, Hans Rempel and CTO Dominic Letts um, about two years ago, so in 2018. Um, so we have offices in Taipei, Taiwan and Berlin, Germany. And Diode is a blockchain designed for IoT devices. Um, our vision is to see a thriving worldwide network operating on a fully decentralized infrastructure. And we see ourselves as a key player in the Web3 ecosystem, um, making contributions to the Web3 infrastructure. So in addition to working at Diode, um, I'm also the founder of Radical Exchange Taipei chapter, um, which started in um, July last year. And we were very fortunate to have had the opportunity to get to know a number of leaders' insights over the last year. Um, so we had um, Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tan, um, Tang Fong, um, and Radical Exchange Foundation CEO, Jennifer, um, and Ethereum creator, um, Vitaly Buren. He was also here. Um, also the Exodus blockchain firm makers um, coming to the co-working space in Taipei City um, our very first meetup event in July last year. So, and then afterwards we had many other events. Um, so we had uh, Dr. Chang Wu Chen um, and CC Liang and my colleague Peter Lai and Bitmark um, team members. And so a lot of folks and many of them are coming from Taipei Ethereum group because I was involved a lot <laughs> in the Taipei Ethereum group. So it's like a combination of these groups of people. Um, so we were very happy to have them um, and the, for this year, um, the Radical Exchange Conference event was in June and Radical Exchange Taipei chapter collaborated with Bitmark um, to organize an online workshop. And the workshop was called Restoring Data Dignity in COVID-19, uh, a Taiwanese experience. And it was made possible by Vivian Chen, um, a community advocate at Bitmark um, and Hai Jing. She's also the, um, the marketing manager at Bitmark. 
Um, so we had a really great uh, like a discussion with the radical exchange international like community leaders um, to discuss um, the data dignity in the context of healthcare, healthcare data. Um, so today I'd like to share two stories. Um, so one story is, you know, like how um, about the, uh, the implementation of project voting in Taiwan's presidential hackathon. So that's one, one story. Um, so the other story I like to talk about is um, the example of how open source developers in Gov Zero civic tech community folks are using their skills to drive change in Taiwan. So first story is about um, hackathon. I'm really a big fan of hackathon. Um, so a little bit about how the Taiwanese presidential hackathon used credit voting to vote on winning projects. Um, so, so Taiwan's presidential hackathon has been around for three years now. Um, so usually a hackathon could be like a two day event or three day event. Um, for example, East London, UK um, was a three day event in February. Um, East Denver hackathon event was, um, if I remember it correctly, was, was also a three day event held at um, Sports Castle in February in Denver. Um, but for the presidential hackathon, it was three months. And three months is, is a long time. Um, so more, more than 100 people would propose project ideas every year. Um, and in the months of April, May, and June, so about three months of time, the Taiwanese government runs this special hackathon event. And the idea is to bring the programmers together for a cause. And how it worked was, um, so instead of giving out a ton of money, like a ton of like prize money to the winning teams. Um, so instead of that, the winning teams will receive a promise from the Taiwanese government. Um, so essentially a promise from President Tsai Ing-wen um, that the government will be making their ideas turn into a reality. Um, and so Taiwan's president um, Tsai Ing-wen will listen to all these pitches, like all these present uh, selected proposals. Um, and for the winning teams, there's going to be a be like a picture of like the president handing the trophy to the team members and then making the promise that whatever you prototype in the three months, um, she's going to commit it to, to, to make it in, uh, into part of the national policies in the next 12 months. So that's a big deal for a lot of developers because it's so, it's so much more than just, just getting the money. It's about like implementation or seeing the real change going on. Um, so. So last year and this year, um, the second and third edition of presidential hackathon, um, the credit voting system was adopted to vote on which projects that would make the most impact to the society and really deserve the recognitions. Um, so the adoption was incredibly successful because it made the voting res uh, results for proposals and all of these cool project ideas um, to be more in line with the needs of the public. Um, so before adopting QV, the way it worked was um, we would have 10 judges um, to select 20 teams out of 100 teams. Um, so however, this is obviously has like its own problem because the selection will reflect um, the judges' personal preferences. Um, so by this time, um, the, the adoption of quadratic voting means that we open up 30% of the entire scoring mechanism um, to people who have text or um, email authentication to allocate 99 points. So 99 voice credits for each voter. So it's 99 rather than 100 points as in Colorado, um, because then people won't even have the possibility of you joining, going, like just going there and voting everything on the same project. So after voting for nine votes, um, which is sent 81 points, um, you still have 18 points left, right? Um, so that makes people want to look for other projects um, to spend the rest of the points. Um, so I'm not a developer, and, but, um, but I've worked with a lot of engineers and developers over the time. And I, it was really great to see all of these interesting ideas turn into reality and like how these really, really made my pr perspectives change because I used to think that the government is very slow to respond or like slow to change. And like, and I, I, I see leaders like Audrey Tan and like Gao Jialian, CL Gao, is, uh, he's the, like one of the leaders behind Gov Zero community. Um, so they, these people really showed up 
and really showed up on, on GitHub and really showed up on like at all these like hacking events and really led by example. And it was really mind blowing to me and really show like a large group of young developers in Taiwan and show them what's possible and how they can um, collaborate with the government agencies and deliver real change. Um, so I, um, so the next, the second story, if I still have time, <laughs> the second story is about <laughs> political donation records. Um, so this is a story that I really wanted to share because it's incredibly interesting. Um, so so the, it's about um, political donations and political campaign finance data being made public, publicly online available. Um, so the story, I think it's, it's, um, it's covered by a lot of Mandarin Chinese local news media in Taiwan, but maybe not so much in English language media. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting example and it's, it, it's it's very like underreported, I would say. Um, so this was back in 2014 um, when political candidates and politicians had to submit the political um, donation records to Taiwan's control yuan. Um, so interestingly, um, the data kept by control yuan was not easily obtainable. So the information was not generally obtainable somehow and they claimed that they wanted to protect the privacy of the candidates. Um, so obviously this made no sense, of course. Uh, so at the time, only um, Taiwanese individuals who are 20 years old or older um, can visit Control Yuan in Taipei City to make an inquiry in person and request to make a print copy of the records. So you have to be there in person. You have to make the trip. Um, so, so that was what the GovZero civic hackers did. So a group of volunteers, basically, um, they made the trip to Control Yuan and printed out um, the donation records. Um, so one page at a time, one page at a time. And after collecting all the data, um, the next step is to sort it out, right? And then manage it. So those papers are filled with tables um, with each role shows like the names of the candidates um, and how much money they've received and how do they receive it. And like more importantly, like who are the people behind? Like who are the people who are really giving the, the money to those candidates? Um, so once you've got the print copies of the donation records, um, you, can, you can scan it, um, you can turn it into an image data. And at this point, the challenge was um, the texts were not, not so uh, machine readable, um, meaning that um, advanced computer vision technology wasn't able to parse all the text and Mandarin Chinese characters from the tables, right? Um, but they were good enough to slice and dice the tables into cells. Um, so what these civic developers did was they decided to collaborate and build a crowdsource website in order to better display the images of the cells for people to key in the text. Um, so we had the raw data of um, donation records and we had the data um, of the political campaign finance and there were a lot of um, developers became more involved because all the attention, like excitement uh, and, the, and the media attention on, on the project and pressed for better data visualizations um, and also data um, journalism for people to better understand the insights behind those data and like how we can interpret it and understand like how our political candidates are being funded. Um, so the result, I'm gonna say the result right now, um, so the result was um, within 24 hours, um, over 10,000 people completed some 300,000 data entries um, from some 2,000 documents. Um, and the government decided to amend the Political um, Donations Act in 2014. Um, and the new act um, was finally implemented in June 2018 and the new act was about making the political campaign finance data publicly available online. And it was a huge deal. Um, and it was all over the media. Um, I, I, I was a bit surprised that very little English, like international people know about this specific story. It, it, was, it was a huge deal. Um, I, so, so I think, I think um, this is a perfect example of how GovZero community folks built an online system from scratch 
and make Taiwan's control against political domain records publicly available. And I want to call, I just want to quickly call out the names, <laughs> the leaders behind this project, um, Ronnie Wong, Wang Xiangrong, and uh, Xin Chang Jian, Jian Xin Chang, are um, some of the leaders behind this specific project. Um, and what we get right now is an online system that makes the data available and searchable and eventually increase the level of data transparency as well as accountability that people desire. And so, so this website uh, allows people to type in keywords and uh, use the advanced search function to find the data on specific political parties, groups, candidates, donor, donators, um, and it also allows you to search by election, um, download the entire files for each of the election districts um, and candidates for a specific um, election for comparative research and analysis. Um, so I want to conclude by uh, inviting everyone to join our GovZero Summit this happening this year in December. Um, so it's, an, it's a highly anticipated um, open data, open government, um, go open source conference event. Uh, it's called Gov Zero Summit. Um, Gov Zero Summit, and it's going to take place in Tainan, uh, which is uh, the southern part of Taiwan. And I will uh, will be happy to see everyone there. So I'm going to stop here because I think I have talked too much. But it's very interesting to to yeah to share, and I um I'm excited to hear what other people think about these stories too. Perfect. Thank you very much. This is extremely interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin, could I please ask you to share with us the stories about quadratic funding in Colorado? Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> uh, really excited to, to, to be talking about quadratic funding and um, the experiment that we did in Colorado to do quadratic funding for, for Main Street for the coronavirus economic recovery. So um, just a little bit of background before I get into that. Uh, I, I'm an entrepreneur based in Boulder, Colorado, and I run a project called Gitcoin, which is a place that you can get coins if you're a software engineer working on open source software. Um, open source software is a public goods problem Open source software creates $400 billion per year worth of economic value for the world. And open source software developers often aren't even paid for their contributions. So our digital infrastructure is just made by, maintained by volunteers. I think that's a wrong, and it's our mission at Gitcoin to solve that problem, to grow and sustain open source. And so we run a program called Gitcoin Grants, which is basically like a crypto Patreon where you can support open source software developers. And um, we've done about $2.5 million in the last 18 months worth of funding for open source software developers. And we're using quadratic funding um, to, to basically make that, that game theory work. So. Um, Using quadratic funding, we basically set aside around 200K per quarter and we match the community contributions to open source software developers during a two week period every quarter. And so um, we're doing about 500K per quarter, half that is allocated from the Ethereum Foundation, which is kind of like the central, like think of them like the government entity in the Ethereum space. And half of it is from crowdfunding. So basically, we found a way to get the community to co-fund public goods in the Ethereum space along with the Ethereum Foundation, which is, which is really great because not only are they funding public goods, but they're also pushing power to the edges by using quadratic funding. As opposed to a centralized grant administrator de deciding where the money goes, we are, as a community, deciding where the money goes using the quadratic funding formula. So basically, one of the amazing things is that people don't contribute to public goods because of the free rider problem, which is basically, why would I contribute to this public good when it's going to exist regardless of whether or not I contribute? Uh, I'll just free ride. That's the rational economic behavior. What quadratic funding does is it creates this, this thing where if, if I contribute a dollar to a grant, it can be matched by $100 from the Ethereum Foundation because of the way quadratic funding works it pushes power to the edges and it optimizes for the number of contributors when allocating matching funds as opposed to the amount that are contributing. So, uh, uh, sorry, the amount contributed. So, so basically the super cool thing is that we've, we've raised $2.5 million 
worth of funding for open source software using Gitcoin grants. And when coronavirus hit, I was like, whoa, there's all this economic stimulus money, but it's not making it to the small businesses across the world that are that are creating our pluralistic, diverse main streets uh, with with local values. Um, you know, it's being administered by the stimulus money was being administered by these big banks and by the federal government. And they they didn't know how to get into the nooks and crannies of the economy that uh, were the mom and pop shops. Uh, in in my opinion, I think I've read figures that. 98% uh, of the money that was in the stimulus went to large, larger corporations. And so we have this formula, quadratic funding, that's really amazing at pushing power out to the edges and distributing money in a democratic way. Why not use it for coronavirus-related economic recovery? And so that's what we did. We launched it, downtownstimulus.com, which was a pilot round of a 25K quadratic funding round uh, with five business, businesses in downtown Boulder, Time Work, Warp, excuse me, Time Warp Comics, Peace, Love, and Chocolate, Amani Yoga, J Lounge, um, and Condition. These are all private businesses, but together having a livable downtown is a public good. Having mom and pop, mom and pop shops instead of just Walmart is part of a public good, having a walkable downtown. And so I'm, I'm happy to say that we successfully raised 43K for downtown uh, recovery, uh, downtown stimulus recovery in Boulder, Colorado. This was in June of 2020. So this is like fresh off the press or I guess fresh off the bits if you're a digital person. And so, yeah, we proved that quadratic funding works outside of just the weird niche Ethereum space and it actually works in mainstream America. And, um, you know, we're, we're looking for ways to, uh, to, to franchise this across the state and across the country. If you know anyone in Polis's government, maybe we could ask them about uh, about doing it uh, in other places in Colorado. But um, I'm really long on quadratic funding. I think it's a really amazing way of aligning public and private incentives. And I think it's amazing that the game theory works not only in 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 the digital bleeding edge, like open source software, but also in our downtowns. We can create a more democratic economic recovery using quadratic funding. And I think that we proved that with with downtown stimulus. So excited to jam with everyone uh, about this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for all three of you for your work. This is something that I might have forgotten to say in the beginning, because I really think that these are extremely important things for our uh, societies and for the for the planet in the end also. So first of all, I would like to sort of straightforwardly uh, ask something. Uh, for somebody, this, this talk is, among other things, also intended to sort of inform people who would like to include some of these institutional innovations in their own communities, in their own institutional structures, and so forth. So I would like to sort of start off with a sort of very straightforward question of, do you have any particular advice to somebody who would like to, to start doing something like this in their own whether it's community or institutional, is there something that during the process of this implementation that you found, that you sort of uh, found out something that because we all we are all sort of we are all I am personally quite convinced with the, with regards to mechanisms themselves, with regards to sort of open uh, government and with regards to quadratic funding and voting. However, when it comes to actual implementation of these things within institutions or within uh, the society, the communities, uh, these things are not as straightforward as they seem. And so I would like to hear from you about this. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Yeah, I, I'll take a quick swing at it. Um, so basically, the number one thing that we've learned with quadratic funding for Gitcoin is to do the math for them. Users don't want it like the, the mathy formula with, with QF is really powerful, but people don't want to have to do the math. And so, um, I just want to share really quickly my screen. I hope that that's okay. Um, the Gitcoin team came up with this open source website, WTF, WTF is QF.com, which talks all about why it's the mathematically optimal way to fund public goods in a democratic community. And one of the things that we did was we added a calculator here so that you could do, so that the website could do the math for you. And I can just kind of show you here that if I go in and I fund grant one with, 
10 contributions of $1 and I fund grant two with one contribution for $10, that the matching amount for the democratically supported public good is gonna be much higher. The website did the math, you don't have to do the math. And this is the power of quadratic funding. It optimizes for the, 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 the poor and the many as opposed to the rich and the few. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is put together a list of projects that are doing quadratic funding and quadratic voting of which you can, you can visit all of them on WTFisqf.com. And the thing that I'm most proud of that will help people getting quadratic funding off the ground in their communities is that, um, is that we've open sourced a JavaScript and a Python implementation of the quadratic funding formula so that people can just take it out of the box and put it into whatever, uh, whatever project they're doing. Um, and we've also got uh, downtownstimulus.com and Gitcoin Grants, both of which are open source software, and you can just copy and use it in your own community. The, the project is already built and it's already optimized for doing quadratic funding. So I'm a big believer in open source software, and we've got a bunch of free, release, or free resources for anyone who wants to get QF off the ground at WTFisQF.com. Feel free to check it out. It's all free. It's all open source. Perfect. Cool. Yeah, the, <clears throat> I think the only thing I'll add, and, and Kevin did it exactly right, it, he made it tangible, right? He, he shared mm -hmm. a screen and we saw exactly what the impacts were. And we've seen that as we work with state employees, um, you know, you, you can you teach someone to ride a bike by like putting them in a conference room and showing them a video and giving them a PowerPoint. But like the, the way to learn to ride a bike is to like actually get out there and try riding it. And you might scrape your knee up a little bit, but that's okay. That's how you learn. And so um, we spent a lot of time trying to explain it and get the details just right. And it wasn't a successful approach. The, the successful approach was just to try and get people in a room and get them using it and do a couple rounds, you know, tinker, iterate. That's the, that's the right way to do it. Um, and we found a lot of success that way. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yasin, do you have some, have you noticed? Uh, yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think I think because um, I also helped start the Taipei Ethereum group. So what we did was um, a lot of workshop, like tutorial workshops and hackathons going on and like a lot of conference, like discussions and small events like seminars going on. Um, so I think these are really important and like to invite the policy makers, like the researchers under the government agencies, like invite all those people that you are maybe not so comfortable with because <laughs> I like I hang out with all these engineers and developers and sometimes they're hesitant to invite them um, but I would I would urge that because I'm coming from the like the more of a magazine journalism background and like I'm not too afraid of like interacting with different sectors or different groups and coming from different backgrounds and so I think if you have the willingness to communicate and to to collaborate, there's endless possibilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically the idea is to always invite and show people that things work, like to actually involve them in, in the process a lot and to show them that things work. Uh, I, second thing I, I was thinking about asking you, when it comes to these, do you think that, uh, <clears throat> these sort of good results for instance or uh things actually working out would basically be the sort of relevant conditions for these innovations to have some kind of long-term sustainability would you would you find that this sort of because things work out this do you believe that these things could become sort of sticky in a sense to, to sort of have this sort of you know, long-term life of its own. Ben, you said that people themselves, like that parts of uh, the, the government, I mean, some agencies actually called you to, to, to start doing uh, quadratic voting. So in this sense, the good, like the, the, the there is a, it's a good name, right? The, the quadratic voting sort of started having its own sort of life. Yeah, I, um, I think I spend most of my trying most of my time trying to get people to use data and tools like quadratic voting. I, you know, I'm, I'm not the engineer. I'm not the one who's doing the programming. Um, 
and, and it's my job to just kind of be the cheerleader and get people to, to, to adopt these tools and adopt this thinking. Uh, and so the, the problem you bring up is, is one I struggle with and wrestle with every day. Um, you know, government is data rich and information poor. We have hundreds of databases and systems that are all working in the background to help you get your driver's license or to help, you know, the local business get their business license or uh, to help give services or cash benefits to people. Um, and all those systems sit varied and apart from each other. Uh, and, and so what we spend most of our time is focusing on behaviors, just like you said, Marco, is, you mm -hmm. know, what are people actually doing? You know, what, what changes their behavior? And, and we look at a lot of like Cass Sunstein's work and nudge theory and, you know, how do we just get them to think about things a little bit differently? Um, and so as strange as, it, as strange as it sounds, we spent a lot of time kind of building these visual dashboards, right? And, and there's like a website out there that exists that people can go to if they want to see all the information that, you know, drives, drives key decision. We find people don't, you know, voluntarily want to go look and dive deep in data dashboards and things like that, especially our, our state leaders who don't have time, right? Like they're, they're going from meeting to meeting. And so the, the way we found good adoption to make it sticky to get people to is to kind of put it right in front of their face and, and to do so on a regular basis. And so um, as weird as weird as it sounds, we've, you know, we use PDFs more than I think we use interactive dashboards because it shows up in someone's email. They have to read it. It's sitting there in front of their face. It forces them to kind of confront the realities. And, and we do the same with, with quadratic voting. So we take the results um, and we spend a lot of time packaging the results in a way that changes behavior. We send those reports out to people so they see them directly and, and they make different decisions. And that's the goal. Once, once people start making different decisions on it, start using those tools, they're gonna wanna go back and use those tools again. Um, and so we found that um, our behavioral health task force as we rethink the way we provide mental and behavioral health in the state of Colorado, today is disparate. We wanna centralize a lot of that work and focus on a singular administration and singular outcomes. Um, we got a team, an interagency team all together from both the private sector and the public sector. And they, they begged us to use quadratic voting uh, because the agency had used it, because they saw the results, because the managers and leaders had done it before. Um, and so they, they wanted to use it again because it was like right there in front of their face. Um, and so that, that's the way we've done it, in, in, at least in state government in Colorado. Um, but I, I'd be curious to hear what other people think. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kevin Yasin, do you maybe have some ideas about sort of keeping things? Hmm? Uh, what? Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> ah, the question was how to make these innovations sticky, how to make them stick, you know, how to uh, not for all of these things not to be sort of one off. I mean, I do know that in Taiwan sort of this culture has developed. So in this sense, culture itself makes the whole thing, I mean, all the innovations much stickier by themselves, of course. But in, for instance, in Colorado, as, as Ben was saying, it appears you need to, again, show people constantly, this is how it works. It works, it works, you know. So if maybe you guys all had some thoughts about this. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think that, um, <clears throat> Downtown Stimulus was a one-off project. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to do is get funding for another matching round. And so, uh, you know, I have, I think I have a lot more like juju in the Ethereum space, like I guess political capital is probably what it's called, uh, than I do in, in, in Colorado state politics. Um, but, uh, and so I've had more success in creating consistency in the Ethereum space than I have in Colorado, but maybe we could transpose um, the momentum of, of, of the Ethereum space into Colorado. Um, we've just found that making it consistent has been an important part of, 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 uh, of running quadratic funding in the Ethereum space. So the Ethereum community knows that every two or three months, Gitcoin's gonna run a quadratic funding round. And, um, and while it's running during those two week periods, it's wall to wall. Everyone's saying, hey, fund my grant, fund my grant, fund my grant. A $1 contribution would be $25 worth of funding for me, fund my grant, fund my grant. So it kind of reminds people every two months. And um, for those of you who don't follow crypto market cycles, you, you, you may not know this, but we just actually went through a two-year consolidation period in which not a lot of people were putting money into open source and into crypto 
crypto projects. And so a lot of people who have committed their, their professional careers and their family, uh, their families, like their, their mortgage, like having to pay their mortgage and support their family uh, with blockchain based work have really been having a hard time finding ways to make ends meet through that two year bear period. And so I think that um, the fact that Gitcoin grants and quadratic funding was a uh, something they could rely on through those tough times and is, is really, you know, I hope to build an information age institution. Um, if you believe that we're transitioning from an industrial age in which public goods were funded by governments uh, and taxation to an information age in which we're gonna have information like native money and we're gonna have public goods that are funded by information money systems, then I think if we're gonna create an information age institution, then um, quadratic funding could, could, could be it. And it's all about creating that consistency. Uh, so far, I've been successful in creating consistent funding for quadratic funding in the Ethereum space, but I haven't, I haven't done the unlock in, in Colorado. So, you know, maybe using the ra radical exchange community, we can run more QF campaigns across Colorado and, and nationwide. There certainly seems to be enough uh, stimulus money floating around. I just don't think that enough people know about quadratic funding and quadratic voting uh, to connect the dots yet, but I'm hopeful that that will change. Oh, one other thing to make it sticky. I just thought of this. Um, I'm an engineer and like, I like to like, my favorite character on Star Trek is Spock because uh, he's very logical. But um, one of the things that I've learned about selling quadratic funding is that the formula is really freaking powerful, but you know what's even more powerful to everyday people? The stories of the people who made it through that bear market because of quadratic funding. The people that are really talented and have a ton of upside, their humanistic stories of people who survived the bear market created new hundred million dollar companies that that didn't exist before before um, and were able to stay in the space because of quadratic funding. I think that those stories are a really powerful way to get people see to see how how impactful quadratic funding and quadratic voting can be. So you can bet that we're going to be trying to tell those stories over the next over the next several years. I was also wondering <clears throat> if I may. Kevin, sort of, how did you, uh, the sort of, how was downtown stimulus advertised? You had a lot of sort of offline advertisements and so forth. I mean, how did people even know to, you know, come to this web page? How did they even know that this was going on? Yeah. So um, basically, what we did was, uh, you can go to downtownstimulus.com and you can see mm -hmm. the the website is is up still. So you just go mm -hmm. to downtownstimulus.com. You know, hopefully. In the future, we'll make you select between Boulder and Denver and Longmont and Westminster and all these other downtowns. But for now, it's just Boulder. And so you you go to the website and um, there is, while the round was running, there would be a little checkout button here. And and it would have a an estimate of, oh, donate $10 and this, and this business will get $90 or something like that, depending on the quadratic funding formula. But um, basically what we leveraged was that all of these businesses had email lists. And so uh, we had them all promote the campaign to their email lists. And that was a great way of getting the word out. Um, in, in a world in, that wasn't affected by coronavirus, I would have loved to have papered the downtown with flyers and with advertisements for downtown stimulus, but not a lot of people are out on the streets. And even when they are on the streets, they're not by their computer to do a campaign. So. We just basically leverage the the email lists, but I mean, on a one of the things that that we succeeded to do with Gitcoin grants that we didn't do with Downtown Stimulus was in Gitcoin grants, the average funder of public goods funds seven grants, so they're they're supporting a pluralistic group of grants mm -hmm. because Gitcoin grants has become such a like pervasive institution during those rounds. With Downtown Stimulus, the average funder funded one point two businesses. So you can tell that there's a pretty big gap in in how much people are sharing the wealth between the different projects between those two things. And I think that one of the goals, if we ever do downtown stimulus again, will be to get people supporting five or six businesses instead of one or two. And um, I would really like to improve that next time next time we run it. But the direct answer to your question is email lists. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. So. I was wondering, uh, when Ben, when you were talking about, uh, <clears throat> when I listened to your talk on uh, Radical Exchange Conference, you, uh, as far as I could understand, sort of, uh, 
quadratic voting was mostly was probably st most strongly used for issues that were between different government agencies. So, right? Am I correct? In yes, okay. So I just wanted to ask it: Was it used uh, in order to select the issues for which there should be a task force that is, you know, between agencies? Did this also take place? Yeah, um, that's a really good question, Marco. <clears throat> so the the structure was we we brought people from different government agencies together who have similar outcomes, similar social outcomes they're all focused on, um, but from our bureaucratic nature, from you know the the way that governments were built and the the history of government structures uh, have been siloed off into different program areas, um, and it. It was a key, and what we found is that it, it determined the success of the quadratic voting uh, pretty significantly when we had um, had tailored those projects and those questions to be the right questions. Um, and it, it's, it's something I think we struggle with and still struggle with is you know how um, I should I should give an example. Um, public health. So when we think about public health, you know, from the COVID nineteen to air quality to the environment we live in, um, you know the health side is spread out between human services and Medicaid. Um, and then the environment side is spread out between public health and environment and, and natural resources. And, and all of these agencies work together to accomplish the same kind of social outcome and social mission. Uh, and, and when you focus on that problem that you want to solve, and I think Yashin talked about this too, it's, it's all about the problems you're trying to solve. And when you kind of get everyone to focus on the same problem, ask the same questions, like, you know, how do we actually get people to focus on the outcomes and not the outputs? You, we, we see a change in the way the bureaucracy works together. So not just how can you get more grant dollars out or um, how can you meet with more people, but it's how do we reduce the suicide rate? Mm -hmm. And when you focus on those social outcomes and ask those questions, people change their mindset. So it's less about like, I'm gonna do more for my program or I'm gonna do more for my project. And it gets them kind of thinking about the longer term impacts, starting with the end in mind um, and, and allows them to be more you know, self-critical of their own part. Does my program actually help reduce the suicide rate overall? Does, does my friend across you know, my agency boundary actually help reduce the suicide rate more? And if, if the governor and the legislature is telling me that what I care about is reducing the suicide rate, let's make the best and smartest decisions possible. And so we, we try to kind of up level to the, to the social outcomes. Um, I think much the same way, and, and we look to Taiwan a lot and read a lot of the stuff coming out of Taiwan that uh, is, is so interesting and so fascinating, um, and, and we're a little jealous of the culture they've created because they, you know, just as she mentioned, when you focus on that campaign finance problem, you get the entire culture involved, and everyone becomes problem solvers uh, in, in their own mind, and everyone's kind of focused in the same direction. <clears throat> excuse me, same direction. Yes, thank you very much. I I find this uh, focus on the problems and the sort of, I refer to is it as debundling of uh, sort of political positions. You know, you don't have to, you know, you sort of, you completely rearrange the way that people, you know, engage with their, you know, real policy issues. So in this sense, I think that uh, we Taiwan has made uh, this debundling a very, very sort of prominent and interesting aspect of open source governance. <clears throat> so uh, I would I have millions of questions and I hope that we'll have the chance to sometimes <laughs> do this again. But at this point, we have some questions from the audience that I think that we should uh, address. So uh, we have actually quite a few. So since we have something like, I think 15 minutes more not to keep you forever here. Um, so the first question is, uh, Ben, can you imagine something like Gov Zero happening in the US? Um, we're certainly working really hard to, to make the culture here in Colorado something that um, it will someday emulate some of the, the leadership we're seeing out of uh, places like Taiwan. Um, we have some work to do, it's certainly uh, something we're focused on. Um, I, I think, you know, with the work that Kevin's doing here in Boulder, and, and we have a good tech community here in Colorado, and it's, it's about engaging them and, and trusting them and understanding that government can be nimble, government can change fast, government can be innovative, uh, they just live in a different space than the private sector, and so we just have to, to pose the right problems, and I, I think, yeah, someday, I, I really hope so. Thanks. 
Uh, the second question is, uh, and this is for uh, Kevin, perhaps mostly, but not necessarily only for, for Kevin, but also probably for Ben and Yasin, please feel free to pitch in as well. Uh, the, the question is, uh, what are the speakers' strategies for increasing understanding and adoption of uh, uh, quadratic finance among minority and less educated communities? So in a sense, we already touched upon this, but maybe you could perhaps sort of, you know, maybe uh, focus more on this specific groups. Some. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, and I think it's like, it's worth noting that relative to the existing institutions, quadratic funding and quadratic voting um, push power to the edges, right? So with Gitcoin grants, instead of a central grant administrator, who depending on the community may or may not have a, you know, a underprivileged or diverse background, um, you, you're now measuring how much funding should go where based off of whether or not a project or a business is respected by its peers, by the peers in the community. And so I think that um, just, just native like apples to apples comparison, quadratic funding and quadratic voting is a better way to support public goods um, in an underprivileged community or in, in, in a diverse community. Um, and so I think that like, I, I think that like starting from there is, is a really important, important place because we wanna fund uh, a pluralistic vision of all sorts of different types of value and not just like what Wall Street thinks is valuable. So I, I think that that optimization is like a fundamental difference from the old world to the new world. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, with respect to the work that we're doing right now, I hope to run more downtown stimulus rounds um, in, in, uh, in, in all sorts of different communities across Colorado and nationwide. And I think that it's really just a matter of finding the funding uh, that that believes that this is a worthwhile use of their use of their funds. And I think I, I, I honestly think there's enough value aligned governments and and uh, private donors out there to make this happen. I just don't think that they actually know how you know Q, QF is here and it, and it works. So we have to spread the good word about that in order to make it happen. But I think from a public policy perspective, QF is absolutely optimized to fund democratic public goods. And so I think it's it's gonna be a killer power tool in the 21st century for making sure those communities are supported. Perfect. Uh, so the, again, I think if we're, that I think that Colorado mostly sort of joined the, <laughs> our talk. So the question was mostly focused on Colorado, unfortunately. But in the light of COVID, the question goes, how can Colorado facilitate electronic signature gathering for citizen-led ballot initiatives? What are the implications of making it easier? I find this, I'm not very, could you maybe uh, give us some more information about this? Yeah, um, we we actually as an administration signed an executive order to allow for that kind of uh, electronic signature gathering, and um, it's it's something that's baked into our constitution, the language about um, being in person to make that signature. And so we we need to think about some changes because we were actually um, we we faced some legal challenges, and so we had to rescind that executive order and go back to the way things were done before because of uh, some decisions of the, the judiciary branch. And so we, you know we look forward to making. Uh, some technological advances to make you know government services virtual, virtually available anywhere, anytime to anybody in the state. Um, it's, it's something this administration cares a lot about. Uh, but there, the complexity often lies in the, the legal structure, um, not necessarily in, in the technological challenges, but but in the the way that we've written our laws. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so I would like to ask. Uh, the last question for uh, Yasin and Ben, with, in terms of, uh, do you sort of, you already mentioned it briefly, but I would like you to, to spend like a few minutes more on it, on this uh, new form, uh, so to speak, uh, how is open governance or in, uh, in, in the Colorado case, it's, I, I understand it's within the government, but even within the government, there is a need for trust and for the, Need for legitimacy of certain uh, decisions and so forth. So I'd like to ask you to sort of 
just give me a few more sentences about how does this legitimacy and trust become sort of increased through the use of these uh, mechanisms or through this civic, uh, cult civic hacking culture. So I think the only person who can answer is Ben. <laughs> Why? But uh, I would also like to know about Taiwan. I mean, it is quite interesting in Taiwan. I will need to console somebody. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't quite understand you, sorry. <laughs> I will need to console our digital minister. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but also when it comes to Gov Zero, you already mentioned that sort of... Uh, so Gov if you're asking for Gov sort of Zero, default. I probably have something to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so Gov Zero is incredibly interesting. Um, I um, maybe a few things about Coscop. So Coscop is is an open source, like the Taiwan's biggest open source tech conference in Ta in Taiwan. Um, so it's uh, uh, C C U S C O P, right? <laughs> C, wait, oh, C-O-S-C-U-P, sorry. Um, so that's that's the, the conference where they gather all the open source enthusiasts and, and they, they gather all these bunch of people uh, together and you don't have to be a programmer. A lot of journalists and, and people were coming together for, for this event. Um, and then that was the first time I encountered the idea, like the concept of open source. Um, and Gov Zero at that time in 2012, um, just starting out. So they, they've been around for eight years. Um, and I think it's incredibly interesting because what some of the leaders, like I think one of the most well-known one is uh, Gao, Gao Jialiang, Gao Chunzhang. So CL Gao, he is a, a very, you know, the, the opinion leader in the space. And so if, he has something to say, people listen to him. And so I think he has, you know, the, this kind of, um, you, the, he, he will say something and then attract all those attentions and, and really call out for actions. Um, and I have like met some of the other leaders in the Gov Zero tech com community. Um, they pointed me to different materials and papers and books that are incredibly valuable to me because at the time I didn't know anything about <laughs> open source. Um, so I think I remember there was this senior uh, engineer, um, Drake Guan, he pointed me to this, I think it was a book. Um, it was called The, the Cathedral and the, the, the Bazaar. Um, and then it talked about, <laughs> yeah, I think it talked about the idea of Linux and how it was built and then you know, how this idea like the the users are your co-creators. They, they are no longer just users, they are, they are um, building the product together or like the, this, the software together. So it's it, it, it's a lot about software development, but for me, it's it's mind blowing because because um, the, the background that I'm coming from like doesn't have this kind of culture and doesn't have this kind of mind, mindset. I was really intrigued by all these culture and, and, and stories. And I think those are the things that really people really be attracted to because it's a very um, purpose-driven, I would say, um, group that they, they really find meaningful work in what they do. And it's, it's not just about coding and programming anymore because they are doing something that's for a cause. Um, so I, I think, I think if, if you can, like attract those leaders and like um, urge them, <laughs> urge them to, you know, be, be like Kevin <laughs> and be like, <laughs> like say something um, that you that will urge the kind of positive, like create the kind of positive uh, impact and call out for for a change. It will make um, a really profound impact that we that we would never see before. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ian, I think you're exactly right. And um, the governor Polis describes to create a government for all, for like Colorado for all. And it, it changes this mindset. When you think about just like you mentioned with Linux, 
like our citizens are not just people we talk at, but it's, it's people we work together with to create a better state. I mean, it, it changes the mindset about how we do things. And it's not just about giving people a driver's license, right? It's about how do we engage them and listen to their skills and listen to their opinions about changing the way we do work, changing the way we, we help improve our society. Um, and it, it is, it's a mindset shift and, and you're exactly right. It, it's hard, uh, but it's, it's worthwhile. Perfect. And it appears to me that also this sort of, as you were mentioning, Ben, before, the sort of results that things sort of work, that it's not just a sort of empty call to participate, but something that actually they see that things are, as you said, that the government can be efficient and can actually get some work done, you know. Uh, and with Gov Zero, that, and especially with sort of residential hackathon that Yasin was talking about, that certain things are going to be implemented, that it's not just sort of, uh, you know, just just some empty call for this, for participation, but it's something that actually sort of has some kind of tangible result that changes their life in some way. I mean, the changes their everyday functioning of, of their communities is something that is sort of most valuable when it comes to building, you know, trust and, and, and legitimacy of, of things is getting done. Okay, so, Thank you very much for this conversation. I hope that you enjoyed it, at least partially as I did. And thank you very much for your work. And I hope that we will have a chance to talk about these things again. And I hope that uh, uh, all of these amazing innovation, institutional and, and social upgrades, as we refer to them, are going to be sticky and that they are going to just uh, keep creating a better sort of more pluralistic and more decentralized and uh, in the end more fairer future. Yes. Thank you very much. I hope you guys will have a, have a chance to visit Taipei. Um, yeah, if you do and to. please, yeah, please contact me. <laughs> um, I like to visit Colorado again too. Yeah, real quick, Shil, uh, I ran the Sustain Web 3 conference that you came to uh, in Denver, yes, and we're looking to do another one of those in February. Knock on wood, if the coronavirus stuff is over, we'll be having more public good funding conversations in, in there. And yes, I would love to take you up on your, your offer to visit Taipei uh, once the, the travel restrictions are, are lifted, of course. Marco, thanks well, for having us. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thanks, Mario. Stay safe.